Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and serve Him as His dear children. But we have disobeyed Him and deserve only His wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to Him and plead for His mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord.
chapter 5, beginning at verse 1. This will serve as our sermon text this evening. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm, then, and do not allow anyone to be put under the yoke of slavery on you again. Look, I, Paul, tell you that if you allow yourselves to be circumcised, Christ will be of no benefit to you. I testify again to every man who obliges himself to be circumcised, he is obligated to do the whole law. You who are trying to be declared righteous by the law are completely separated from Christ. You have fallen from grace. Indeed, through the Spirit, we by faith are eagerly waiting for the sure hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision matters. Rather, it is faith working through love that matters. This is the word of our God. We now sing the verse of the day, God's word is our great heritage. <laughs>
Evangelical Lutheran Synod my entire life. I have only known this church body, and I love it dearly, and that is partially the reason why I serve it as a pastor. However, I can say with all authority that one of the greatest monkeys on the back of all of us Wells Lutherans our entire life has been this. It has been our doctrine of fellowship. And the reason why our doctrine of fellowship has always been kind of a, a, a monkey on our back is because we do not do things that other congregations do. And people, because of that, think that we're a little loose, we're a little stuffy, we're a little high and mighty, as we have been called. Now, as I've said before in other sermons, if we are standoffish and aloof, and we are actually being standoffish and aloof, then we should really repent of those things. But I've also found that the most open-hearted Wells Lutheran, the most generous congregation, the most caring and loving people in our church body who open their heart to everybody, still are called standoffish and aloof because of this doctrine of fellowship. And people have a hard time explaining it. Of course, a lot of us like to go right to Bible passages, which say we should mark those who cause error and avoid them. But that doesn't do it for a lot of people. So what I've found over the years is another way to come at the problem, another way to explain to those who don't like what I'm doing why I'm doing what I'm doing. And I've come out this way. I maintain my doctrine of fellowship because I love the freedom that the gospel has given me. I love my freedom, and I won't let anyone take it away from me. And the best passage of Scripture to explain what I mean by that is the passage before us tonight, Genesis, uh, Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not allow anyone to put a yoke of slavery on you again. There, it's right there. Paul says you are free. Don't let anyone put a yoke of slavery on you. Now, what do I mean by this? The biggest problem I find that most people have with this passage is they completely misunderstand what is meant by freedom. We, as Americans, understand freedom in three basic ways. However, all of those ways are not what Paul's talking about. Some of us, when we talk about freedom, we mean political freedom. Patrick Henry, give me liberty or give me death. He's arguing for political freedom. We need freedom from Great Britain and the tyranny they're putting against us. And of course, in its proper setting, that's a good thing. I'm glad to be an American. I'm even proud to be an American. And I'm proud of the rights and privileges I have as an American citizen. And there is a place for us to be proud of our political freedom. But Paul's not talking about political freedom here. Another type of freedom that many of us think about is social freedom. That's the type of freedom that Martin Luther King Jr. preached about. When Martin Luther King Jr. stood at the, the steps of the Washington Monument and said, it is my dream that a man is judged not by the color of his skin, but by the content of his character. What he was saying there in the shadow of that wonderful monument was this. All of those wonderful things that Washington said, those are not true simply of Europeans. They're true of my people, too. And the freedoms that are granted to your people should be granted to my people as well. And we, of course, would applaud that statement. That's a beautiful statement. That the groups, the freedom given to one group of people should also be given to another group. And of course, that's good in its place. But again, that's not what Paul's talking about when he talks about freedom. And the last kind of freedom that unfortunately we Americans love way too much is the freedom to sin. The freedom to go and drink how much I want and say what I want and speak what I want and do whatever I want. And it's a sad hallmark of our society, especially American society in this 20th century, that we have thrown all caution to the wind and put me in front of everything else and look at the whirlwind we have reaped as a result of that. Now, I don't think I have to spend any time telling you that certainly is not what Paul's talking about. Paul is not saying that Christ died for us so we could do whatever we wanted to with our bodies and our minds and our souls. Obviously, that's just silly and wrong to even consider. So friends, if it's not political freedom, if it's not social freedom, if it's not sinful freedom, then what kind of freedom is Paul talking about? It is this freedom. It is the freedom from the condemnation of God's holy law. And that freedom, friends, is as high above the earth as the heavens are. 
The freedom that Paul is talking about is the whole diamond. All the other freedoms I mentioned are like pea gravel by comparison. Because this freedom, in the end, is the only freedom that matters. Let me prove that to you tonight. All kinds of people in this world will scoff at my statement that freedom from the condemnation of the law, freedom of the conscience, freedom from the fear of death is far greater than political freedom or social freedom or civil freedom. Most people in America would laugh me out of the room if I said that. They would say, oh, come on now, Pastor. Look, look at what's on the line in this election. Look at what, what's going on. Oh, you can put Jesus aside for a while. This is what's really important. Stop preaching about Jesus. Preach about President Trump for a while. And what I would say to that person is this. Let's say that on Tuesday next, President Trump wins in a landslide. Let's say he wins all 50 states. What difference is that going to make to the member of our congregation who is dying of cancer? What difference is that going to make to your kid who just gets the COVID diagnosis from his doctor this week? What difference does that make to you who have broken the sixth commandment with your boyfriend and, and now you're carrying a child and you have guilt weighing upon you? How are you going to talk to your parents? What good did that win do you? Let's say we give the social justice warriors of this country everything that they want, everything that they demand. Let's say we do that. Will all the nurses, will all the nursing homes in town shut up? Will all the funeral homes in town go out of business as a result? Friends, those freedoms that everybody likes to bang the drum at, march the street at, wear t-shirts about, they change the truth of this statement that Ezekiel makes, the soul that sins dies. Shakespeare wrote once, conscience makes cowards of us all. What did he mean by that? He said the reason why men fear death more than anything else is because in their deep heart of hearts they know that they owe God for what they've done. They know there's going to be an accounting for what they do and that they try to do is put it off as long as possible. And you know there's nothing in this world that's going to stop it. Hugo Chavez, the socialist dictator of Venezuela, who had more power than I could ever possibly imagine, and more money than I'll ever have in my life. You know what his dying words were? As he suffered from brain cancer at the end, these were the last words he spoke on this earth. Please don't let me die. What good is it? What good is all the money in the world, all the power in the world, all the things in the world? What good are all the things we create for ourselves if we cannot face God? with an answer for our sin. Only he who has pure hands and a clean heart can stand in the presence of God and all of us, even this side of eternity, know that's not me. I don't care what kind of strong face, I don't care what kind of braggadocio you have in your friends. You know the quiet of your own heart. You cannot stand in the presence of God. And that is why you have lived your life terrified of death. That is why people all around the world are wearing masks because they are terrified of the thought that they will have to face God. But you don't. You don't at all. Christ came into this world to do for you what no man could do, to take away the law's judgment against you. The reason why death is scary is because you have sinned. And the reason why sin is scary is because you have broken the law. And what did Christ come into this world to do for you? He has lived the perfect life for you. Oh yes, God demands each and every one of you be perfect to stand in front of his presence. So God has given you the perfection he demands of you. Let me say that again. Jesus Christ has given to you the perfection he demands of you. What do you think you received in that? You received Christ's perfection as your own. What do you think you receive when you come here and take the Lord's Supper? You are receiving again Christ's perfection as your own. What do you think I preach to you from this gospel? I preach to you that Christ has died for you. Christ has lived for you. And all those obstacles, all that mountain of sin that stood between you and God that rightfully damned you to hell, God has removed that as far as the east is from the west of Christ Jesus. You are free of the condemnation. You can 
look death in the face and say, do your worst. There is nothing you can do to me death that Christ has not already unknown. I've used this as an example for many years. Maybe you'll appreciate it, maybe you won't. But for a Christian, death is no more scary than dropping off your suit at the dry cleaner. You drop off a dirty suit, and you're going to get it back clean. When we die, we drop our, our body off dirty, and we get it back, it is clean, resembling Christ's glorious body on that great day of resurrection. That's what we get. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. And all this Christ has given to you without charge, without cost. You, the beggar that you are, simply held your hand out, and to your great relief, he has put an inestimable bag of gold in your hand. He has given you more than all the riches of all the world. I think of that wonderful baptismal hymn. God's own child, I gladly say it, I've been baptized into Christ. He, because I could not pay it, gave the full redemption price. Do I need earth's treasures in any? I have one worth more than any. That brought me salvation free, lasting to eternity. And friends, because this freedom from condemnation is so important and so wonderful and so great, we must stand firm in it and not let anyone take it from us. Now, in Paul's day, Paul had a major problem in the church in Galatia. And that problem was there was a number of people in that church who said, yes, this Jesus thing you're talking about, Paul, that's great, that's wonderful. We're all on board with that old Jesus thing. But you know what? It's not enough. It's not enough. Not only do you have to have Jesus, but you know what? Everybody better also do all those Old Testament laws. You better do all the stuff that were in the Old Testament and Jesus. It doesn't seem like all that much when you stop and think about it. Paul talks about circumcision. Well, circumcision is painful, but it's, it's a one-time thing, guys. It's not that big a deal. Why does Paul make such a big deal? If Paul goes far as saying, if you let yourself be circumcised, you have lost Christ. That's a pretty stark statement. Because Paul understands what it means. It's a big deal because what you're saying is, Jesus isn't enough. When you say Jesus plus anything. Even if Jesus is 99%, and even if the plus is only 1%, what you are saying is this. You're saying that Jesus is not enough. Now that's a blasphemous statement in and of itself. To look at Jesus Christ and to look at what he's done on the cross and what he's offering to you, and then you are calling him a liar. That way, when you say that, you are saying when Jesus says from the cross, it is finished. No, it's not. Oh, you did a lot, Jesus. Thanks for the stuff that you did. But it's not. It's like saying to Jesus, you know, Jesus, you give me 450 miles worth of gas in my car, but, you know, I have to go 500 miles. It's not enough. But here's the second problem with saying that Jesus plus thing. How are you ever sure that you've accomplished the plus? How are you ever sure that you've done the one percent that is demanded of you? How can you be sure of anything that depends upon you? Let me give you an example. A man walks into a Catholic priest's office and he says, Father, I am so desperate, I don't know if I'm going to go to heaven. My sins bother me so. And the priest says, well, that's a serious problem. What you should do is go to Mass a second time this week. Say the rosary next or six times. Do four active contritions. Will that help that man? Will that give that man any more confidence? No, he's asking to do the very same thing that drove him in there in the first place. He's going to be just as unsure of those works as he was before. Worse yet, if he believes that those works are getting him into heaven, now he's completely lost Christ. Now he says, I'm going to heaven not because of Jesus, but because I did my Hail Marys and because I did what the priest told me to. Well, let's say the same man goes to the pan Christian church down the street, the general Protestant church down the street. Well, he says the same problem. Pastor, I feel troubled by my sins. And the pastor says to him, well, go home and read your Bible and pray until you stop feeling that way. 
said any better? What should I read? And how will I know when I stop feeling better? There again, he's driving the person to his own works. But then he comes into Pastor Minder's office. He says, Pastor Minder, I feel awful about my sins. And I say to him, Hey, is Jesus the Son of God? Well, I don't want to be the doctor and Pastor Minder. Just go with me. Trust me. Is Jesus the full Son of God? Yes. Is he the true Son of Man? Yes. Did he live a perfect life on your behalf? Yes, he did. Did he die for your sins? Yes. Were you baptized? Yes. What happened at your baptism? Well, Jesus gave me his righteousness. What's your problem? What's your problem again? Did Jesus lie to you at baptism? Did he lie to you from the cross? Did he lie to you from the scriptures? When he says your sins are forgiven, is he saying maybe they're forgiven? Or is he saying your sins are forgiven? Is not the whole reason I'm in your life is to remind you in case you forget that your sins are forgiven? Is not the whole reason we have a church so that you can come back each week when you've gone up and down through that roller coaster of life to come back to that same touchstone of truth that never changes? Your sins are forgiven. My favorite all time story of any Lutheran pastor is this one. The man in the hospital dying who was worried about his sins. His pastor came to visit him. Man said the same thing. I'm worried about my sins. Pastor said the same thing I just said to you. And then the parishioner said this to his pastor. Yes, but I don't feel forgiven. And this is what the pastor said to him in all seriousness. To hell with your feelings. That's not too strong of a language. To hell with your feelings. Are you going to trust your feelings over the pierced hands of Jesus Christ? Are you going to trust your feelings over Jesus' resurrected body coming out of the grave? Are you going to trust your feelings over the word of God that says to you again and again and again, Jesus has forgiven? Are you going to go against what St. John says to you, but we have a testimony greater than our feelings? We have Jesus Christ. Friends, do you understand the heritage that you have been given? There's only one reason I'm a Wells Lutheran. One. It's not because I was born a Wells Lutheran. If that was the case, I would have left a long time ago. It's because I believe that you people are so much more holy than any other church in town. Ha! I've been a pastor long enough to know that there is not a single sin that happens in this parish that doesn't happen in any other parish that's not going to be found out in the world. Do I believe that this church is the only church you can be saved at? No, I do not. I have met people who will be far ahead of the banquet of heaven me who are not members of this church, who have lived a very pious, simple life and trust in Jesus Christ in an amazing way. So why, Pastor, why am I a member of this church? Why do I stand in this church and none other for one simple reason? Because here, in this place, out of all the churches, out of all the communities in the world, does the gospel shine unbroken by any man's work or taint? It is the only place where you would hear the gospel alone, not the gospel plus anything. And I will not let anyone add a plus to my gospel. Jesus and Jesus alone is what we hear. The reason why I'm a Wells Lutheran is the same reason why back in the day they had Wonderful lighthouses all along the shore of Lake Superior during the days of the coal boats. And there in the storm, sloshing back and forth over those great beasts going into the Luth and Marquette and Houghton. Captains and crew worried that they were going to drown or die, and suddenly they saw the light, and that light pointed them to the storm because it shined and it was unbroken. It cut through all the fog, it cut through all the danger, and it guided them through all the shoals to safety. That's why I'm a member of this church. And that's why I will make no apologies for the doctrine that I preach here. Because it is Jesus alone. And that is our Reformation heritage, brothers and sisters in Christ. That is what it means to be a Lutheran. We shine in the dark. And we do not apologize for it. Amen. Would you please stand? Now may the peace of God that you pass us all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in faith in Christ.
Christ Jesus. Now I invite you to join with me in reciting the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Would you please be seated? We'll now join together in the prayer of the day. For our prayer this evening, after each petition of our prayer, uh, we would ask you to uh, please say, hear our prayer. You will hear the words, Lord, have mercy, and then I invite you to say, hear our prayer. In our uh, special prayers this evening, we, we keep in our prayers uh, Barbara um, uh, Frank, Barbara Frank, a member of our congregation. Uh, Barbara had to be taken to the Twin Cities, and there was a surgery uh, done this last week on Monday. And uh, uh, surgery did not go well. Uh, she is in a, uh, a hospital facility right now, uh, recovering from that surgery, and hopefully um, things will, will improve. Um, uh, to make matters more difficult, uh, that uh, that hospital was, uh, or that hospital center was um, um, shut down today because of COVID-19, uh, and uh, so her, her husband Thomas is not able to visit her directly, and so it's been an extremely hard burden on both. Of so we pray especially for Barbara this evening that the Lord heal her and bring her safely home. We also pray on behalf of, of her husband Thomas uh, that he also be given strength during this time as well. Brothers and sisters, let us pray. Almighty God, you have shown your faithfulness by raising up those in every generation who will call the church to repentance and renewal. Continue to raise up voices in our own day who herald the truth of your word and proclaim the faith and purity and truth against all enemies. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Everlasting Father, you do not desire the death of the sinner, but want all to come to faith and life in Christ. Raise up faithful pastors to preach your word without fail and teach the doctrine delivered to the saints that many may hear and believe. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful Lord, your word has died that guiding light through all ages. Help us bring your grace to those in darkness, to grant them freedom through the forgiveness of their sins. Bless missionaries serving far and near and new congregations they established in your name. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Holy and gracious God, your power is revealed chiefly in showing mercy to those in need. Give to the sick healing, to the troubled peace, and to the grieving comfort, and to the dying peace. Hear us especially this evening on behalf of Barbara Frank and those who we pray in her name. Please be with her as she recovers from her surgery. Please be with her husband Thomas as he prays for her and waits for her to be returned home. Lord, we ask that you give them a special measure of your patience, grace, and kindness and forgiveness during this trial of trial and tribulation. Lord, in your mercy. Gracious God and Father, your own Son has set a table among us and given us his own body and blood as the bread of heaven to give us strength for our faith. Throughout the ages, you spoke through the holy prophets until that day when you were delivered up. Bless those who are learning the gospel. Bless those who hear the gospel. Encourage us with the word. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord, we now join together in praying the prayer you have taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, we thank you for teaching us the things you want us to believe in you. Help us by your Holy Spirit to keep your words in pure hearts that we may be strengthened in faith, guided in holiness, and comforted in life and in death. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever.
shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Lord, look upon you with this favor and give you this peace. <laughs> Oh God. 